It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's our goal. Hey! It's, our goal. hey. it's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. Oh, my God. So nice of you to join us. This is a great show today. We've got the great Duncan Trussell coming back onto the program. I love Duncan Trussell. He's been on the program before. I like that I'm calling it a program. It seems kind of old-timey. I like it, though. Duncan is great, very inventive. He hosts the Duncan Trussell Family Hour podcast. So good. He's got the Midnight Gospel, which is uh, people loved this podcast so much that they made it into an animated series on Netflix. And he is just... Uh, He's a he's a philosopher. He's a comedian. He is an adventurer. And I there's not one subject you could you talk to Duncan about where you're not going to have new thoughts introduced from his crazy brain to yours. And he's hilarious and one of the best laughs in comedy. So, yes, we've got Duncan Trussell today. Very excited. Um, hope you're doing well. I just got back from recording my new Netflix special. Very excited about that. Very excited about a lot of things this morning. Uh, it went really well. I can't wait for you to see it. That will be, I don't have a release date for it yet, but it seems like before the end of the year, you'll get to see it. Uh, so a big thank you to everybody that came out. For those two sold out shows in Boston and a big thank you to everybody who came to the shows all along the way over the last two years as we were putting together the set and uh, getting as funny as we possibly could. And uh, we did everything that we could and we finally put it down. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, today's show is brought to you by TomPapa.com. Oh, that's what a, that's so great. <laughs> I have uh, I have a bunch of shows coming up in Albany. We've got a show at the Egg. We've got a show at the Count Basie Theater in New Jersey. We've got Dallas. Uh, let's see, this is coming out on Tuesday. So we've got Dallas on this weekend. Big show over there. Um, touring all over the place. Going really crazy up until Thanksgiving, pretty much. And then we're going to take, uh, not, not a break, but we're going to downshift a tad as we roll into uh, the new year and then the new tour, which I'll be announcing that name and all that good stuff um, as soon as we uh, get our act together. <laughs> um, I know I'm going really crazy because uh, the amount of bread I've been able to bake has been uh, small. It hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been, I haven't been cranking it out. I come in, I feed the starter on Sunday. I crank out the bread uh, late Tuesday, have it all folded and shaped and ready to go on Tuesday, on Monday, and then Tuesday, and then uh, give away one, feed the family the other, and then go someplace else. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> so it uh, it hasn't been... The, the, the kitchen is... Uh, the, the, the dogs are looking at me like, why haven't we been... Why haven't we been making anything? Why are you not grilling? You're not baking? What is happening, Tom? All I can say, dogs, is um, dad's got to go out and uh, and find the money. Dad's got to go to work once in a while. And that's what we're doing now. So I'm going to try and hit all these spots on the road. I'm going over to uh, Ratsa Pizza on this trip. I'm going to try and uh, hit up with uh, Dave Richer and and my friend Anthony, who both have been on this program before, and I'm going to get to Jersey City and finally have their infamous pizza. And uh, and also, you know, I kind of dialed it in for the special and tried to be uh, skinny, sexy Tom. And now it's time to be uh, fat, jolly Tom as we roll <laughs> into the uh, the fall and holiday seasons. And I know I mentioned that last week, so hopefully, um, hopefully I'm um, you know, where other podcasts and other Instagram posts are like, be a better you and and work harder and do more push-ups. You know, we'll let those people put that pressure on. My pressure, my peer pressure is get out there and eat and enjoy yourself and then and, and get the treats that, that the season demands. So get on it, kids. I want you one pant size bigger 
by my birthday on November 10th. <laughs> All right, let's jump into it. It's Duncan Trussell. So much fun. Such a great conversation. Always with Duncan Trussell. So enjoy. <laughs> Good to see you, Tom. How you doing? Good. How's it going? Great. Sorry I'm late. I thought it was at four. That's quite all right. We've, we've had stuff to do around here. There's always something to do. Yes, there is. Nice um, to see you, Duncan. Let's jump right in. You. Let's do it. Holy cow. It's been a beat. How long has it been? It's been six months? Yeah, I think something like that. I'll tell you how long it's been. I'll tell you how long it's you been. You tell me how long. It's been long enough where you got tired of where you were living. Yes. For packing your bags for California. That's right. And stopped in Texas. That's it. I'm in Austin. <laughs> I really wanted you to come all the way to California. We tried. Son of a hoo-ha. What do you mean you tried? Well, we looked at a bunch of places there. And oh, you did? Yes, we did. And, you know, it was just, it's like the, the house you can get in Austin compared to the house in L.A. It's a way different house. Is so, it really? Oh is it my that, God. that big of a difference? You know what? It's I don't know the last time you bought a house in LA. It's been a while. How long have you been in your place? Eight. Eight years. So now you have probably become a billionaire from the <laughs> value in the eight years. Whatever you bought your house for, it's probably worth a billion dollars more. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we tried. We looked at a bunch of places and it, we found a place, actually. We put a bid in on a place. Do you oh. know how many other people we were competing with? 19 oh my god 19 people put in bids for this house oh my god yeah it was see, so insane see that's this is the weird thing that's that's i can't seem to figure out and i can't figure out a lot of things Maybe. but the the whole like narrative of LA's done. California's done. People are fleeing. They're leaving in droves. Yeah. Uh, there's big problems. You don't see a future, blah, blah, blah. And then 19 people trying to buy a house. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not done for people. It's done for a certain income bracket, depending on where you want to live. Right. It's definitely not done. It's not done for like Saudi royalty. It's not done for... <laughs> <laughs> it's great it's great for for th that and it's i think it's you know great for people who were lucky enough to invest in property there before the markets went insane it's right. great for them but it's like you know i don't think any i think anytime anyone starts saying this city is done that city's done and i'm yeah. certainly guilty of that when i'm trying to like you know make a decision you're like oh it's done <laughs> no no, no the, one of the biggest cities in the world is not done that's <laughs> not the case if it's done we're done but yeah definitely you know la is kind of fucked up right now i mean i think you'd be a little naive to not recognize all the big cities are going through oh yeah pandemic you'd be nuts to not admit that no a hundred percent come on it's amazing how much we're really because it seemed like, you know, as, as everyone was just kind of like, we're getting through it. We're getting through it. We're going to be OK. We're going to get through it. We're going to yeah. be OK. And it was like, in a, in a very real sense, we were. But now you're starting to see the after effects of it globally, globally. Yes. This is not a U.S. thing. This is globally. And it really started to sink in with me just over the last couple of months. Like, oh, no, this is this is a 10 year yeah. correction. This For is going to sure. take a good 10 years before we start to uh, to really get back to some kind of uh, new operating system. That's right. I mean, you know, and, and it's interesting to think about that because now that we understand like uh, the way that uh, computers get faster, you can like actually draw a map of technologically where we're going to be in 10 years. And then from that perspective, maybe you could say LA is done, everything's done, the concept of city is done, the idea of location is done, the idea of what it is to be human is done. You know, so maybe yeah. LA is done, <laughs> as is everything. Yeah, but it's shifting into something new. Like, I, you know, I, I talked to these people when I was at a wedding, and these two groups of people were both talking about how they haven't been back to work. And they said it's just a really they're all working from home yes. and they don't go into the they don't have that commute. They don't go to their big office building. Yeah. And they said it's really difficult for a company to say, come in when we've 
done the same work as successfully as we did before. Yeah. But this new way. That's right. I was like, oh man. So what do you do with those buildings? <laughs> what yeah. do you do with those giant buildings? In yeah, what do you Manhattan? do in, in, in Manhattan and in LA? What are we to do with these empty office buildings in LA? Surely there's no one we could put there. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone's got a house. Everyone in LA has a place to live. That's I mean, maybe that's one of the problems in the city. I, I don't know what we can do. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. You yeah. Could put like, uh, I don't know, sand, like store extra sand from the <laughs> beach in the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Just go different themes like they do at the Madonna Inn. Yeah. Just like do different theme buildings. You can go yeah. live in the tropical building or the uh, it's outer chin, space building. It's a chin scratcher. It really <laughs> is. It's chin. I mean, it's like from one perspective, you're looking at the promise of technology, which was the idea was it's going to make life easier. Yeah. It's going to render antiquated ways of doing work obsolete. Yeah. Technology comes, people are still going to the office, even though I think the point of going to the office for a lot of people was because you needed the filing cabinets, right? Like that was the idea. <laughs> it's like filing, filing. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the human being thing? Like, I have to, I, I mean, I don't know how all businesses work, but I know when I'm around other people, my brain is now more active. I'm connecting with somebody else. I'm doing more stuff. We're like yes. feeding off of each other. There is something of that, little, you know, we're little carpenter ants. And well, then, you, I know, mean, you know, the only way people can really interact is when they're selling their life energy to corporations. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way for us to get together. It's been that way forever. And yeah. I agree with you. It's one of the big problems. <laughs> Where, how do we mingle or hang out if we're not, if we're not do, working, if we're not doing business, if we're not turning our action into money? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We're not, it's, all, it's all just like trying to adapt to... Uh, you know, understanding that, you know, re like learning new habits. Like, I, I think yeah. like people need to like within the, the newness of like, Oh shit, we don't have to commute anymore. That's incredible. Uh, I think maybe then somewhere in that we've got to figure out ways to, you know, change the rhythm. Yeah. You know, I work from home. You do a podcast, you know, you're, we, we both go on the road, you know, how busy you get. Yeah. You know, like I got kids in, in, in the, uh, in my house, I go in there to get like a, a, a mug of tea. They were like, dad, they don't understand when I'm like, gotta go. And I have to run back out. It's, it's not good. So like, yeah, you know, putting yourself to like stop working in the middle of the day, mm -hmm. which is hard to understand how to do. If your whole life has been, you work, you wake up, yeah. you work, then you're not working anymore. Yeah. It's tricky. Don't you get a real feeling like when you're out and about, like I just had it last night. I was going over to Largo to do a spot and it was, you know, seven 30 at night and I'm driving from the Valley over to over the Hill. And there was just a, an intensity to the rhythm of that commute. That was like, Oh, I remember this one. I yeah. remember this. I remember this intensity. I remember when it was this, because even though yeah. we're back and there's certain elements of busy, you still get this feeling on the spectrum of, Oh no, what I thought was busy wasn't really the pitch that we were at before all of this. Right. And last last night cool. gave me a little bit of that pitch. It's like it really is an interesting yeah. hive existence. Like we really do have like uh, this rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it wasn't always that rhythm. No. You no, know, that's the that's the to, that's the thing is like just because we're born into this rhythm, if you read about the way people used to work the whole way that we work now is like kind of alien. It's all based on industrialization. Apparently like when people used to live together in mm -hmm. villages, tribes, whatever, there'd be shit to do. Everybody would get together and work their asses off together. And then, then when there's nothing to do, they would just hang out and fuck and, and like party. And nobody was like, oh shit, man, I'm slacking here. Because they, right. you know, it's like this is great, nothing to do, and and then there was something to do, and you would all get together and do it. That was the rhythm. Now yeah. it's like you got to do something, man. What are you doing? What are you? What's going on? When did that? When did that? When did that? When did that switch? 
Well, um, 20th century. I guess so. Yeah, I read some yeah. about it. Maybe or maybe uh, I mean it probably the the metronome started going faster around the I guess what they call the agrarian revolution, like uh-huh. when people started having farms. That changed hunter gatherer culture right. to a more rhythmic you know uh, the growing crops you got to wake up at a certain time i think within that you still Mm -hmm. had okay we're done we've stored everything up i don't know yeah so there are still intense periods of work and then intense periods of uh, or or periods of resting Mm -hmm. and then industrialization happens now it's like you know that's when clock towers started appearing you know that used to not be a thing the clocks everywhere and all that you didn't having a clock was like weird yeah that is uh, that is bizarre to think of this dominant clock in the middle of the town square get to work yeah get to work those weird i I saw this thing i guess they're these people who would like like throw shit at your window to wake you up because not everybody had alarm clocks so you would pay someone to come by and like pelt your window to wake you up (laughs) oh man now it is it is possible I mean, you know, this is a thing. I've got all these uh, nephews, like, you know, up until they're like 30. And they've been dealing with this whole, I mean, their reality, like their prime of get out and go, the, the starting block, the st- the starting shot hit, and they ran into the pandemic and all this other stuff. And they kind of, they all collectively, in their different ways, different interests, different stuff, all collectively have this, no, working myself to the bone isn't a life like I should yeah. be enjoying myself. I should be. And the old the elders in the family are like, when I was your age, I was doing this and I was going working really yeah. hard to do this. And I heard my father say just recently last week. Maybe they're not wrong. Yeah. Maybe they're not wrong. like the old school thing of like you got to go and you got to hustle and you, and you look at them and they're like enjoying themselves and they're working and then they ditch that and then take time off and then go back and do something else. And it's like for the first time, it was like, man, they're starting to kind of make sense. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the only time that can become a little suspect is when the reason they're able to do that is because other people are working their asses off. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Like if their yeah. parents or whoever they're with or whatever yeah. is the provider for them, and then they're not really doing anything, and but somebody is, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, then it gets weird. But if somehow they've devised a, a way of living where they are, you know, they don't, they, they've gotten past the stupid, like, things that many people think they need. Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean? And they're, and they're like, yeah, why do I need to, yeah work 40 hours a week to get some bullshit when i'm absolutely happy right now with right. what i have i don't need expensive fucking clothes or some dumb nice car or some <laughs> big stupid house why do you even like uh yeah I mean, who's the classic what is it emerson is it emerson that who writes all about this yeah this transcendentalist movement where he's like when you see when you get jealous i mean this is definitely paraphrasing but when you're jealous of someone He's got a nice house. Picture that person with the house chained to their neck, dragging it down the road. (laughs) (laughs) The amount of energy to pay for the house, keep the house going and all that. It's like, is it worth it? Yeah. My part of it is that there's the two things that I get distracted by by living that way is one is the what happens when you when you're old and you need your teeth fixed? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like creating giving yourself some security when you're when you can't yeah. really work anymore. And the other side of it is, and this is a little tricky, but it's what what are you what are you doing? Is there value to what you're doing in creating <clears throat> like a career and a a thing? And yeah. it's I, I hesitate because it's we're in this unique position. As artists, you kind of know where you're, what you're doing. You're making stuff. Yeah. Like there's, there's a meaning to it. But if you're in a job that, you know, doesn't turn you on, and you're just doing it just to survive, I could see that being a problem. But I do also feel like, you, you there is something to building a, a sense of worth for what you're doing through these years. I, I, and it may be personal, but my like hanging out on a beach and just chasing vacations 
I know for a fact that that doesn't fulfill me. Right. You know well, what I mean? Yes. Man. I mean, like we both love what we do. Like right. when I'm waking up in the morning and I know I've got to do a podcast intro, I've got to try to write a chapter for the book or whatever the shit I'm doing. I'm happy about that. It might be a little stressful because maybe I don't feel funny or creative or whatever, but it's yeah. still, I'm excited to at least try. And there's not some asshole. There's not some <laughs> dude. You yeah. know what I mean? There's a dude. There, we're think like our lives. We get to be comedians. We get to be creators. Some people remember the dude when you had regular jobs. There's a dude. You go in. There's this dude, an <laughs> abrasive personality, definitely getting off on his power. Yep. <laughs> Maybe like in the worst way possible, trying to mentor you, like in the most condescending <laughs> way. And you're thinking to yourself, "What are you mentoring me in? I don't want to fucking get good at blockbuster." I don't want to be you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You think I want to get good at like cleaning fucking video cases, man? I don't want to be good at this. I'm just trying to make money here so I can pay for the ecstasy when I go to the raves. <laughs> I don't, this is hell. Yeah. And, you know, so that's the, that, and when you get caught in that system, yeah. And you, it's scary because you're so in it. That mm. you need that check and you know exactly what you're what like how much money you need a month. If you're not making that, oh, it's terrifying. Then you're praying yeah. to get fired. Yeah. You get fired, you can collect an employment. And it's and it it is a it is a thing like, you know, we're we're in this unique thing where our work is our joy, but you, work doesn't have to be the place that you that gives you that joy. Like when I say like having like a career or some kind of worth, it could be the job is the thing that pays you the money, and then all your friends and family and the work that you do or like you, yeah. you know, you've got a, you've got killer hobbies or you're helping people out. You're working in charities, whatever that thing is like right. that. That's the thing that, that that's the, like the lifelong story that you can tell. It doesn't have to be tied to the thing that's paying you. Well, but if that's the problem, I mean, I think that's what these kids are figuring out is it's yeah. like, but if it's not tied to the thing that's paying me, I mean, it's like, you know, there's a, a story I read, there's a great book called The Harvard Psychedelic Club. And it's all about Tim Leary, Alpert, Post, you know, getting canned. Then like, you know, elite professors who are all like the acid lords of the 60s. They move into this house together where they're all getting high on it, just high as a kite all day long. And I guess someone comes over and there's this fucking piles of dishes in the sink and there's flies and maybe roaches and it smells like shit in there yeah. and that's when the saying came up which is like reverberates to this day through all utopian like ideologies or all utopian visions of how things could be which is who does the dishes and <laughs> yeah, you know what i mean who does yeah. the dishes who's cleaning <laughs> here who is it yeah. i don't want to i want to get fucking high i want to like dissolve into nothingness in between make stupid songs for my podcast who's doing the dishes you know someone yeah. has to do the fucking dishes someone has to cook the fast food somebody has to do all the things that when they stopped working yeah whoo that's when that's when you started hearing some pundits doing rants like look what has happened what set them off was not homelessness what right. set them off was not the social disruption it was that they couldn't get fucking hamburgers fast enough <laughs> and they were like what's going on here man what when it, what where was my hamburger yeah we're getting like money p pandemic money and they're like sorry but the pandemic money it's more than minimum wage and i'm not cooking hamburgers <laughs> if i'm getting pandemic money yeah. and, and and that's where you run into the real reality of this of the system we're in isn't it because that's mm -hmm. where you run to where it's like well, then let's starve them. Well, I guess we're going to have to start starving them out because if we don't starve them, then they're not going to go make the hamburgers. Yeah. You can't put a yeah. gun to their head, but you can maybe shift things around in the economy enough so that it's like, yeah, but yeah. somebody's got to make the fucking hamburgers. It's like when, um, what's his name, was running Yang, and he was saying that there should be that, that uh there should we could pay people not to work. You could take a segment of the population and and pay them. But yeah. that part wasn't clear at when he was when he had that idea, because it did really change things. I remember talking to someone in Philadelphia and they're like, this isn't good that these people <laughs> just are have money and nothing to do. This right. is, it's changed my neighborhood. This is not for the better. 
right. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is like the, it, 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 it's, and again, it's just like if we have begun to identify our identities with our work, and if that's what is taking up our time and, and we never had a chance to learn other things to do. Yeah. If, if, cause, cause really like, if if you look at like where automation is going, did you see Musk's new robot? Yes. Not a, not great right now. <laughs> not a great robot. Walks like Joe Biden. It's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he looks like he's tra- like yeah, he's on a wet tile floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's like definitely nothing to fear. Like you're not gonna make a Terminator movie with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like it when it first started when they unveiled it and it didn't move. I was yeah. like, uh oh, oh no. Yeah. Because it just looked kind of like dark and scary and yeah. like all industrial. And then it, once it started moving, I was like, oh, oh we're wow. okay. It's going to take that thing three months to make a sandwich. It's like, it's, it's like not, not definitely not, <laughs> not much, but you know, it will be something because the market pressure is there. Yeah. And, 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 and eventually it, it gets to the point where, uh, we run into this fascinating, horrible problem, which is, look, you've got to pay people a living wage. It's the ethical thing to do. And if you don't pay people a living wage and they figured out other ways to exist or just had the epiphany that, look, I'll just eat canned fucking tuna. Like right. if I just don't eat out and like I, I can I can uh, Uber, I can do like, I can figure it out. I don't need to spend my whole life in a, in a Burger King or whatever. Yeah. So you say, all right, well, look, we're going to start paying a living wage, but then there's inflation. So then, but then the profit margins start getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where it's like, all right, at this point, it's going to be cheaper to maintain a fleet of robots to make the hamburgers than it is to pay yeah. people. Then all the jobs go away. It's not yeah. even an option. I know. And so now we're entering full automation, massive unemployment, skyrocketing prices for houses. And that's where you... Like that's where capitalism starts falling apart. Yeah, it doesn't really. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's got to be people smarter than me who are looking at that future and thinking, what are we going to do with the <laughs> the humans? Well, I mean, are. I was yeah. I was getting on to I was getting on a flight in, on uh, United last week and they have new turnstiles when you're boarding the flight, like at the gate where you take your phone and you put the boarding pass on it and a plexiglass thing opens and you get on the plane and there are these flight attendants like trying to get them to work and doing the whole thing and it's like wow they don't i mean they must maybe they realize maybe they don't but these this little rack of turns subway turnstiles you're gone (laughs) yeah once once they are working flawlessly you guys over there trying to get these to work you don't have a job at the gate anymore you don't have a job at the gate no, you don't. You don't have a job at the gate. No one's going to fucking complain. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's no one's going to yell at. It's going to be like, where's the, there, it, there, there's just going to be like a, a, some Android. Like I, there was a, uh, I went to some store in Portland. They had a, a robot a barista who made the <laughs> best cup of coffee. From, it was so good. A latte. It's right. got, it doesn't even have a realistic face. It's just like an emoji. But uh-huh. it can smile and it talks. It <laughs> says your name. If you, you give it your name, it's like, you know, your latte is ready, Duncan. Sounds <laughs> so, so much energy. Definitely not the voice of somebody who's making minimum wage. Who's like yeah. you're working two shifts because they have to to pay for their kids. Oh, this thing doesn't get tired. And it and and, and you're like, wow, well, you, this is really nice. You forget <laughs> like what it means. Like, oh God, what a friendly, happy robot. If only humans could be so happy when I order my expensive lattes. So yeah, so like initially people are gonna be like, this is kind of nice. Like yeah. all these, all these, these personalities and these grumpy employees are gonna be replaced by perfect AI driven. Yeah. It, it's gonna scan your fucking your eyes and see if they're dilating in a way that means stress. It's yeah. gonna like, you know, release some nice relaxing scent. Music around it will like slightly in a subtle way change to something peaceful. You won't even know you're getting hypnotized. And then you're going to just happily walk onto the plane in a better mood. 
Meanwhile, you're going to be like one of like 15 people getting on the plane because nobody can afford to fly. <laughs> there's, no, there's no one. Like, it's all, all the jobs are gone. Yeah. Oh, my God. It That's is where so we're crazy. headed. Yeah. That, the, the real key for us is whether or not technology gets to a point where it will extend our life to see all of this. Because we really, you really got like a 40 year 40 years like what can happen in 40 years if they can extend it we'll be able to see where it all goes but within 40 years it probably won't come tumbling down completely in you think time. you're gonna live 40 more years yeah that is incredibly optimistic man I, that's like wow don't you hell no, i have no idea the way shit's going right now i don't know man i mean like you look great Thank you. I quit drinking. Holy shit. It's the best thing I ever did. It's like you really look good. I was hoping to see you and be like, oh, God, he's in Austin. He's gotten fat. He's just eating bar barbecue sauce in your beard. No, and just kinda... <laughs> no man. I uh, cut you out the good. booze, lost like 15 pounds. Whoa. Been exercise. Feel good. But yeah, you I don't mean that like you and specifically you look great, too, man. I mean, if you're if you're taking vitamins and eating right, and you know, you'll probably live to your life. But I just mean like you know, this fucking pandemic, it's like, look what happened. Just this, like how many people died, how quickly disease spreads around the planet, yeah. you know, and, and the human lifespan has shortened, but the 40 year the idea that you're not going to see these things uh, within the next 40 years, or, uh, you know, if you read Ray Kurzweil's predict predictions is 2045 is the singularity that's by something like 2030 or something uh -huh. by the end of this decade, we've got a compute, but the, close to the end of this decade computers are going to have the processing power of a human brain the next year they'll have the processing power of every human brain on the planet and then then sometime after that is when uh everything that we define as human humanness is uh -huh. not going to be we're going to have this symbiosis with the machines neural implants uh <clears throat> the ability to dial in emotional states via some kind of like neural like interface and mm -hmm. uh obviously like expedited or instantaneous learning of anything you want mm -hmm. everyone will know every language everyone will have access to the internet with their thoughts no more googling just you know how to do everything you'll dial in movements that famous chefs use when they cook so you we want so everyone will be a famous chef everyone will, that's uh -huh. what I, I'm, that's what that sounds cool. pretty cool. Yeah, it's it it sounds fucking great. I mean that it, it's it's and, and within that life extension, within yeah. that you know uh, cure for cancer, within that potentially the ability to like transplant your brain into a synthetic body, mm -hmm. all kinds of weird shit that was in sci-fi movies. Is, coming so quickly so quickly well um this all sounds like it supports my idea of living beyond 40 years oh well yeah i mean that was that's you know again we're going off of like kurzweil's predictions but yeah his predictions are very accurate and because of his ability to prognosticate incoming technological capacities he is like renowned and you know that we like he he's the trend analysis is what he does it's like he tells people okay start planning you know software for this kind of computer that doesn't even exist yet it's going to exist in three years in four years so when, right when the computer comes out you know that's you know when a new a new the new iphone comes out or the, a, a new uh mac comes out yeah and instantly there's software that just works for that mac mm -hmm. why it's because people knew that was coming Right. And they were already building shit for it long before it came. They were ready to go. So, yeah, he says that it's something like at some point the human lifespan will increase by, I don't know. I don't know the exact percentage, but let's say 10 percent. Is he going to make it because he's getting pretty old? Well, that's his whole that's why he's like super into vitamin. That's like he's like yeah. he, he eats like a million vitamins a yeah. day. He's yeah. got huge, just, he just sucks back vitamins and got it <laughs> just because he knows it's going to get to this point. Yeah. And if you can cross that threshold, then functional immortality is possible. Right. Why haven't the airplanes adapted for the new Apple chargers? Like it has that, it's no longer USB. It's like that little one. And you can't charge your phone on a, on a plane with that. 
Uh, what does that have to do with the singularity? That's a great <laughs> question. It's a, you know what? You're the in the in the meeting at United when you're the guy who says that it just gets really quiet in the room. And then whoever's running United, you just see him go in the back and hear a gunshot. It's like pro- probably to replace those on every plane. God only fucking knows. You got to get the union guys in there to replace the fucking yeah. thing. And then, of course, not everyone's going to have the new one. They're going to have the old one, too. You know what I mean? So it's, Some people are still Samsung. God bless our flight attendants. God bless them. They have to like every day. So I'm like, um... So I guess I can't charge my phone. <laughs> so you are uh, not only are you a, a close friend and I, I do miss I really uh, all kidding aside. I was I was not upset, but a little upset. I was upset Thank that you, you weren't in California because I was like, I felt like we were on the precipice of hanging all the time. We were. And I know. And um We'll talk offline, but I feel like maybe I should just make more trips to Austin to, yes. to hang and see you. Um, but you're also a a, a great um, uh, spiritual sounding board. And I just want to share with our listeners what um, I contacted you immediately when I was in uh, Arizona. Yes. Some a fan had coming up, come up and given me. Uh, what looked like a baggie with like little flakes of snot in it, like yeah. dried dried snot, <laughs> and said that this is. Have you heard of our famous our famous toads here in in uh, Arizona? And I was like, What do you mean the ones that you lick? She was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, I do it myself. And she gave me the bag and a uh, hug and took off. And I'm sitting there with this little bag of uh, frog venom that is supposed to make you uh, trip and see God. And I was like, all right, now I've got to figure out what to do. So I called you immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I called you and then I called my wife and then I called you again and said, my wife won't let me. <laughs> but you were also very much like you explained to me what it was. I really wasn't clear on it. Yeah. And it sounded amazing, but also something you shouldn't do when you're in Tempe alone in a hotel. That's it. Right. Yeah. I, I I mentioned it to my wife and she immediately just goes, no, no, you tell him no. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you get married. That's why you get married. <laughs> you, need why you need that because that might not be in your brain. That thing is like, no, no, you're not going to take some weird fucking like crystals from a frog that were Put in a baggie by one of your fans and smoke it in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but we're like, ah, I don't I'm know. like, oh, maybe. I've already seen this forensic files. I don't really have anything to do. <laughs> because then I watched, uh, I watched a YouTube video of this guy who was very thoughtful, and he went down to Costa Rica in a, in an environment where you do smoke it where a, a guy is sitting right next to you. A shaman is with you yeah. very clean. It wasn't like, you know, in the, in the uh, Amazon, like mud huts. It was just like, it was kind of nice. Um, and he took it and it really, he, he was pretty eloquent in the way he was kind of describing it after, but you could just see the euphoria on his face. It was yeah. just like what he, he really just saw that, it seems like the universal thing that people get out of that is that they've seen uh, eternity and that we're a part of it. Yes. And uh, man, that I did not experience that in Tempe, Arizona. It was the opposite of that. It was, oh, this life is going to go on forever and it's kind of bleak and I don't even have a good shower head. You smoked? That's what <laughs> no, it did? No, the reality oh. of being in Tempe. The reality. Oh, like, <laughs> the, 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 the toad was depressed. That was the venom of a very depressed toad. No, the, I mean, the reality of being in that hotel room was like, I could use a, I, I could use okay. a toad venom right now. The glimpse, the view. You could yeah. use the view. The, that's the view. There's so many names for it. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a nice thing to get that. You know, it, yeah. it, 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 and it's an easy thing to... To, for your whole life to never have that experience. Yeah. And part of me was like, well, now I saw the video and I see that it kind of exists out there and I trust this guy. He's got a friendly face. So maybe I don't have to take it. It was hard putting it into the trash on my way out. Yeah. that I, I 
I could, I understand the pull of that. I mean, it looked like so weirdly, like, uh, I, I, I could see how I, I would like put that baggie in view. Yeah. And I'll keep looking at it. Totally. You know? <laughs> be like, uh, maybe I'll just go down the street, get a lighter, <laughs> yeah. get one of those crack roses. <laughs> the seven eleven. Yeah, I know. Oh, it was like, wow, this is it's right here. It's in my hand. Yeah. But, but you know, it is available. I could go and try and chase it down and go to Costa Rica one day, I suppose. You know, in the in the kind of Buddhism that I study, there is basically like very and in buddhism there's like all these uh there's different like uh methods i guess you could say some of them are slow and some of them are like as slow as like this process could take you many lifetimes yeah some of them are fast like they're designed to like bam just show Mm -hmm. you right away what reality is and um if you know when traditionally maybe you're working with a teacher who recognizes where you're at and then like is really good at helping you sort of uh, progress towards that thing that, that a psychedelic can give you instantaneously. And the reason there's the reason for that is that maybe some people aren't quite ready for that view for mm-hmm. the recognizing their unit of consciousness or whatever. Like that mm-hmm. in fact, even though temporarily that might produce this euphoric rush, a huge relief, Oh my God, I'm not just my body ever. I've been here forever. I'm going to be here forever, but uh, potentially that could cause them to then like detach from their lives and Mm -hmm. and, 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 in a way that is not good for them. Like it may, you know, they get too too heaven and not enough earth from that. Right. Out of balance. So that, that, that is the, I think why it's good if you're going to, you know, try something like that to have like a shaman someone who is trained in a tradition where they they can help you understand what what happened to you what did you see versus like coming to in your hotel room Mm -hmm. drooling on your pillow like i guess i'm god (laughs) is room service still available (laughs) walking naked down the hallway yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm God. It's cool. <laughs> there was definitely a part of me that was like, "Come on, man! I tripped a bunch. I can do this. That's not a. There's no. There's no worry." Here's Every time tr- anyone says that, you can hear Lucifer cackling somewhere in the depths of hell. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, baby. Here's the thing. This is a bit on my mind because you see a lot of people. Uh, talk about, you know, that psychedelics have become a, you know, it's pretty fashionable now to treat depression and uh, it's become a little bit more mainstream and and things like that. And that's all cool. I like, I like, I like all of that. Um, The kind of equating tripping with uh, this is proof of a different reality. uh, Mm. I, I have a, I have my doubts about that because it could, sure, it could be, it could show you immortality and it could show you the infinite, or it could be throwing a compound on your brain and no different from alcohol or caffeine or whatever triggers a certain response. And that could be just, you know, just something released in our brain because it was stimulated by that substance. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. Like just to say that, oh, we, oh no, I took this and I saw this, so that is now the reality. Right. I don't know. I mean, I know the feelings, and I know it really makes you feel like you're one with the trees, and we're yeah. one with it, with each other, and it is very unifying. But is that is is that seeing a reality, or is that altering our reality for the moment because of this uh, toxin? Oh well, I mean, this is the <clears throat> this is the sort of what is it what is reality i mean you you run into this the problem the problem is that yeah outside of the uh human body there's all kind of ph- phenomena that are being processed instantaneously by our sense organs and so whatever you are experiencing right now is you could almost say a reflection of some kind of phenomena 
that is happening outside of your sense organs. When, when you're looking at a tree, you really are the tree in the sense that that tree is being, you, it might as well be like a, a DVD. <laughs> that is your brain is playing a Blu-ray, whatever you want to call it. Uh-huh. And your brain is playing some rendition of the tree based on what your neurological capacities are. Some mm-hmm. people, you know, five people can look at a tree you have maybe a person who's colorblind, a person who's got shitty vision, a person with great vision, a person who a tree fell on top of them, you know, <laughs> and they're all going to have a different experience of that tree. Uh-huh. So, and this is not to say there isn't some external reality necessarily, but if you're experiencing reality, you are experiencing your, your mind. You're not, you're, right. or, or a relationship between your mind and external phenomena. Sure. So when you take a psychedelic, uh, you're shifting the way that that whatever that information is, is getting processed. And mm-hmm. maybe from scrambling it up a little bit, you're opening yourself up to the to, to, to some data that wasn't making it through mm-hmm. or, you know, by, you know, shifting the way your brain is processing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe you at the very least, it helps you understand that the world as you understand it really is just a reflection of your own mind. And so in that way, it's epiphanous, you know, but right. is, you're high as a kite and you see uh, a demon, skeletons in the wall, a ghost, uh, or you remember something that you, for from a past life. Yeah. Did, did you see a ghost, a skeleton, a demon? Did you really remember something from a past life? Mm-hmm. Who knows? Yeah. But when you're stone cold sober, and you yeah. think you see a demon, a ghost, or remember something from a Did you really uh-huh. any of those things? Who right. knows? Right. There's no telling. We're dealing with a, 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 a organic biocomputer right. that is prone to error. So, you know, just or these things don't really process reality perfectly. So right. there really is no, I, I don't think there's any way to... to really to tell and also i don't know like it's we're talking about consensus reality versus some subjective heightened reality state but just because lots of people are sharing an experience doesn't necessarily imply that that's real yeah or more real than some subjective experience i mean so i don't know but i you know what does the lord hate you tell me this all the time the lord hates false people who worship false idols you don't want to bow down to the golden calf. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah, that yeah. false idol can be an experience you had on a psychedelic yeah. that you become attached to and can't let go of because it was so incredible. You think, oh my God, that was totally real. When it's like, well, maybe it was for a second, yeah, but it's not yeah. real now. Right. Oh, I missed that little baggie. I you know, kept it. just... I'm pretty in LA. I'm pretty sure that you could just like go open your window and like anyone's got any toe <laughs> venom, just drive through Topanga with your windows open. It'll it'll blow in. <laughs> you know, there's people. There's, everyone in Topanga is on toad venom. Everyone is. I feel sorry for frogs in Topanga Canyon. So I drive past your old spot pretty often um, when I'm going to the studio. And um, and I give you a little wave. I always like fumble with my phone to take wow. a picture and send it to you, but I'm driving. And um, but there's a, there's a house a couple down from you that always did Halloween, does Halloween up in a pretty wow. big way. Um, and you got the little ones now. You're in a new spot. What's your uh, what's your Halloween agenda? Are oh, you man. Uh, do you go full out at the house or the, you are you oh yeah we got folklore the, for the kids? oh yeah we got inflatables we got pumpkins we got I mean it is Halloween time like the nice. youngest he goes Halloween he's like <laughs> you know we found kid stuff that's like Halloween themed and they're completely absorbed in it the oldest is like more interested in really getting scared so like nice. you know finding like ways to like be a little scarier with him the younger one is like. With, you know, I think he likes our inflatable skeleton, but he's keeping his distance. You know, <laughs> he's like, he respects it. 
he like, but he's like not going too close. Wondering why you're cool with it. <laughs> yeah. All right, dad's not running. Dad's not running from this, so I don't have to run, yeah. but I am not getting closer to this. Yeah, thing. yeah. He's like <laughs> definitely keeps like six feet away from the inflatable skull. And you know, like one of the great things about Austin is it's so family friendly and like yeah, you know, our neighborhood has like uh like uh just all kinds of cool cool little like uh, like community things that happen nice. throughout the year so yeah yeah so the kids are definitely getting like a a real like halloween experience uh, we're, that's we're working them up to the big day nice and, does yeah. it feel like fall there yeah it got it cooled down i mean it's a yeah. little hot today but yeah. in the mornings it's it's cool uh-huh. and yeah it's so nice now that the Texas heat is diminishing a little bit. It's yeah. really nice. I've never yeah. experienced this part of I'm always here in the dead of summer. So oh. to get that thing you take for granted in LA. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh my God. The cool <laughs> nights. Uh, how oh, the kids do with it move? How did how did uh good they were cool? They're they're so pliable at that age. Yeah. I think well, I think we just we just made it in. Like if we'd waited yeah. a little bit longer, it would have been, I think, a more traumatic for the older one because he really mm-hmm. was making friends. He liked his school. Yeah. You know, but he likes his new school now. He's got friends he's already made in school that nice. he talks about. And it's it's great. And he says things like, can we stay in Texas forever? You know, oh, so it's, it's, yeah it's good that's a good yeah. feeling yeah he's got his roots now <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's nice yeah it's nice and the comedy scene here is so good like yeah. oh my god it's like it's amazing like the comics here are really funny and you know there's a constant influx of like comics from LA who come through and yeah. like it's really got this like I don't know, you know, the thing, you know, like you, you know, that thing you were at the, in New York, you were in yeah. like LA, you know, that thing where you get this nice group yeah. of like com- hardworking comedians. So you're yeah. always kind of like having to deal with the fact that you have to keep advancing yourself to keep up <laughs> yeah. with them. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. And that's here. So I really like that. Oh, that's good. Where are you playing mostly when you're going up? Vulcan. There's a place called Vulcan Gasworks. Yeah or gas company, Vulcan gas company. And yeah, the owner, Nick is super cool. And they just have like almost every night, there's some kind of really good comedy show sold out. Almost every time I've been there, just packed. Is that where Tony does his thing? Yeah. Kill Tony is like always sold out. Yeah. That was a good spot. I like that place. I had done that during a moon tower. Is that, is that the Austin one moon tower? Yeah. Yeah. And the Creek in the cave is here. Right. So that's another good spot. And then there is the um what's it called? The the they moved. It was like a renowned Austin comedy club. Uh, oh yeah. You know yeah, yeah. About, um, I went there once. I I, I I opened for Jeff Ross there. Shit, I can't believe I can't remember the name. Right. Like, a little outside the city. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of and then there's, you know, all kinds of other spots, I'm sure. And then Rogan's Club's about to open. So that'll be cool. Oh, nice. Is it getting close? I think so. I don't know the exact date, but I know sometime next year, I'm sure it'll be open. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. That's good. Well, I'll come more often just because you're there. Please. You know, I I know that you won't take me up on this, but we do have a nice house and a guest room. You could just stay if you want to be around like the young <laughs> kids like <laughs> undulating between like periods of joy and like screaming <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, <laughs> I'll bake in the bread morning. in the kitchen <laughs> yes that would be great that, and listen i have gotten into like grilling i don't know what happened maybe it's in the air but i got like a one of these traeger smokers oh you did you have one of those things no i i haven't pulled the trigger on that pull the trigger yeah oh shit what are you doing what are you up to brisket steaks but it's like you know i'm i'm not a great chef and uh-huh. certainly not good at uh, you know i'm intimidated by <laughs> grills so and it's certainly a smoker like i'm not like a regular smoker where you have to like modulate the yeah smoke and the heat and i would never be able to do that but this <laughs> thing dump the pellets in you know go on their app do the whatever the recipe is identically uh-huh. and it makes 
just the best, best food you've ever really? tasted. Really? Oh, how long? How long is a brisket on there? Well, it depends on the weight of the brisket. That's uh-huh. how I fucked up on my second brisket. First <laughs> brisket, I got lucky. I got like the, the the weight was like exactly the weight in the recipe, yeah. and I just did what the recipe said. And you let it, you know, brine overnight. In the morning, you put it in the smoker. Uh-huh. You, I don't remember how many hours exactly. It's eight, maybe six. It's temperature, really. Yeah. So you're slow smoking it to this, uh, to a certain temperature, then you're pulling it out. You're doing more shit to the brisket and you put it back in for the last uh, part of it. And then yeah. somehow, somehow I made like this amazing brisket. You're not, it's not supposed to happen. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like you're not supposed to go on stage and do good your first time. <laughs> right. It's not supposed to happen. It's, and, yeah. it, it, and you know, it happens. Comics do that. Yeah. And they're, they get all like puffed Copy. up and they're like, <laughs> shit, I guess I'm Dave Chappelle. And then they just, fucking eat shit the next time because they got lucky. that's yeah. what happened with my brisket like the, the first one was incredible the next one you know the yeah. next one one of our friends was like well this will be good taco meat <laughs> oh. <laughs> they're mean out here in texas they're not gonna lie if your barbecue sucks <laughs> oh man it is funny when your place has like their thing like barbecue is is there and it's like I'm always curious when you do live there, do you, is it so, is it really that much a part of your diet or is it just for when tourists kind of roll through and you eat like more than when you were in LA, but is barbecue and that kind of a thing, does it become part of your like every day? Everyone in the house for a long time was eating brisket (laughs) just because I made so much (laughs) and we had to eat it. Like at first right. people were excited about it. <laughs> and then they're like, God, no, no, I'm more brisket. The dogs were eating brisket. <laughs> Everyone. Uh, isn't so that when the that- best? When, when do your dogs know when, when it's grill time, when they see, yes. right? Like my dog, if I just take out the metal spatula and the, and the, um, the tongs. Yeah. That they just the sound of that coming out of the drawer. Yeah. I haven't even pulled meat out of the fridge yet. They hear teaching both dogs yeah what's up are we doing it are we yeah. doing it <laughs> it's that thing it's that thing the hunt he i guess he hunted i don't know it's, it's coming it's, it's coming me. just follow him don't let him out yeah. of your sight don't let him out of your sight oh my god the brisket weeks for my dogs were just like the i think the best probably the best thing that ever happened to them like for, <laughs> for like weeks it was just brisket in their bowl is brisket no one's going to like they, my wife isn't going to be like, don't feed the dogs brisket. We have too much bag, right. giant bags. And then, you you know, yeah, it's good for them, too. Like their yeah, their fur got like all softer and they were like and they pass out yeah. like after they eat that, they would just like instead of being annoying, they just like collapse <laughs> on the couch, fall asleep. It's great. I'm going to have to make another brisket. Yeah, you, you got me like so. But is it is it like are we like ordering barbecue? Oh yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, of course. Definitely not. more than when I was in LA though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. I know. I've been thinking about that the pellet thing. It's just one more thing in the yard, one more thing next to a grill. Uh, we, but I like oh, that it just they work together. Yeah. Work. Sorry to cut you off, but you, what do you mean? a smoker and a grill. Uh-huh. Very nice. Very nice. Because the smoker it's you're probably gonna like be like it's long term projects with the smoker, you know, right. like the more you have it, the the le- even though steaks on it are incredible, the you know the more interested you become in like, all right, I'm gonna. What happens if I like, if I if I make a a steak, but it takes three days, <laughs> or whatever. Right. You know, you want to like, you want, yeah, you want it to take a long time, and so that means you, um, the grill takes care of like whatever other stuff, corn on the cob. Right, edgy, so you can like sort of like completely cook outside with both. Yeah. So that's had, why the two are great. I've had guys on this on this podcast, uh, the guys from uh Blood So Barbecue and Pig Beach out of Brooklyn. Wow, and uh, man, when they start talking about the sauces and the rubs for their meats, that's when they really that's when, like, for me, the bread thing, like they start going into the into the wormhole, oh, right? That's that's that part of it is. It, it seems like it's endless of what you could come up with or explore. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a religion. I mean, I don't know the way to put it or alchemy, maybe religion is the wrong word. It's like, you know, the alchemist led into gold, weird, like long recipes with like strange machines, yeah. sifters, you know, I don't know, like bizarre chemistry equipment. Yeah, That's how deep it gets because you just, I don't know. It's like, I was talking to, there's this uh, incredible chef here named uh, Yoni and he, uh, you know, has like been sort of like, teaching me a little bit like I was you know when I showed him pictures of my brisket he looked at them the same way that like our doctor looks at pictures of our kids <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean serious solemn yeah like a deep analysis <laughs> of what it looked like then uh, like you know I don't want to say it was like disappointed like compassion in his yeah. eyes you so know where, but, you, where you can improve where you can improve you know yeah. but yeah man like yeah the the, the when they talk about it, it's, I don't want to say serious. It makes it seem too heavy. Uh -huh. but it, it is like, it's yeah. more than just like, it's like you with bread. It really is. It's yeah. like, it's spiritual. There's a spiritual component to it. Yeah. And it's never, and it's never mastered. That's the thing. It's like, right. you can always, you can always, I mean, some of those guys get very consistent, of course, especially if they're running spots, but just as the home version of that, it's like, you're going to screw up and have happy surprises and try and replicate it. And it's like, yeah. it's a journey. It definitely is a journey. It's a journey. And yeah. it's, a, and, and, and he, what, what Yoni was telling me is here's the thing. One, and this is where I fucked up with a second brisket is basically once you make something, you, you might not know why it right. was like that. Yeah. But so, so really you can't, you can't change a lot of variables. You really can only change one thing per brisket. Take something out, uh -huh. add something. And that's how over time you get to like your friends who have like perfected these recipes that are a result of countless, yeah, countless failures, <laughs> right, countless exactly. like yeah. mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So the the, the the recipes are precious yeah. in that regard. But it's, it's all equipment based too. It's like uh -huh. one recipe on one smoker it maybe is not going to work the same on another smoker. So. Right, right. That's why I love it. it uh, I think as comedians, that th these kind of crafts, it's very, it's very analogous to stand up because you can get yes. really good and be a really good crafts person, but you're still moments away from screwing everything up. <laughs> All Absolutely, the time, which is great. Which is so great. Yeah, it's like you you have that joke. And you're getting to the point where you're like, all right, I was delusional. Why did I think this was funny? It worked once in front of some audience. I started thinking this is an incredible joke. It hasn't worked for the last five sets. It's time to euthanize the dog. Like you just, you don't want, you don't want to. It's time. And then, and yeah. then something happens where you change just one word. You change one word and it works again. And now it's working. It was just yeah. one word. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's what sucks when you know that whatever the comedian part of you is telling you, no, no this is, this is a good yeah. joke, but it's not working. It's not, it stopped. It's, and then one tweet <laughs> yeah. and it's back. My new Ooh. thing now, stand up wise is I realize in those moments when things aren't working, is really really pay attention to am i truly communicating with them what i'm seeing in my head like am right. i really truly because you 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 think they they know it and you're like oh no wait they don't know i'm talking about they don't think no i'm talking about a monkey on a bicycle they, they i haven't spelled that part out right i haven't right. told them that part and it's like if i can just try and do that not all the time but some of the times it'll save those ones where I'm walking around thinking it's so funny. Why isn't anyone yeah. it getting this? It's like, well, wait a minute. Are you, they're not in your head. You, you, you've got to, you've got to right. paint it. You've got to, you've got to spell it out. And it does save some of those. Oh my God. And also, yeah. Within that thinking, you have to remember, I'm someone who considers smoking toad venom in hotel rooms. I might not, you know what I mean? Like my, yeah. my way of, of, of thinking about reality might not match everyone's way of thinking about reality. <laughs> I casually <laughs> contemplated smoking toad venom 
<laughs> I was so <laughs> close. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have, if you didn't respond that night. I don't know. I might still be there. <laughs> you, you, who know? I mean, there's no telling. I mean, like, who knows? That stuff is really powerful, but it's got a lot of devout, uh, I don't know. There's many people who swear by it. Yeah. And who, like, they, who claim that it's really, like, change their lives for the better and then yeah there's people who are like fuck that is not fun and it's <laughs> just not fun it's not that long what is time man <laughs> you it's not come out of it. it's not that long we're, we're just gonna dip your foot in boiling oil for <laughs> 10 minutes i mean it's just 10 minutes <laughs> you, you'll be okay <laughs> Duncan, this is so good. I look forward to this all week. Thank you so much. It's so great to see you. I, I really hope you come out here. It, it, like the next time you're here, you got to let me know. Yeah. Just come out. Like it's so, yeah. especially this time of year. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so beautiful. It's it's a perfect time. Yeah. To do it. I will. I will. I'll be there soon. Great. For sure. The hard part is because a, a lot of people that I really like have gone and never come out. It's kind of like the toad venom of, of cities. Um, <laughs> it's like i might go there and get stuck then we win <laughs> then we win it's really I what, <laughs> austin has become jonestown in a weird way it it's really like has. we're all like weirdly like missionaries trying to recruit every I comic know. we love to come here and i try not to do it but yeah it's true we <laughs> want you i see what you're gonna get you i see what we're gonna get you tom <laughs> you're the best duncan you're the best I'll see you soon, buddy. See you soon. Bye. There you have it, kids. Duncan Trussell, once again, does ne this never disappoints. I love him so much. Make sure you listen to his podcast, The Duncan Trussell Hour and uh, Family Hour. And also uh, check out his Netflix show, The, uh, the Midnight Gospel. Uh, it's really creative, really funny. And he goes, you know, he talks surface stuff with us. But on those, he gets really pretty deep and goes... And goes off into the weeds and just a creative force. Thank you so much for listening. Go to TomPapa.com, look up all the fun stuff, and um, I'll see you out there. <laughs>